Sick of looking like this guy when you're on a webinar? Watch this video to find out what hardware to use to look like this guy when meeting with clients virtually on Zoom, WebEx, Teams, and more. Really, don't be that guy. Welcome to Steve on Screen. I'm Eddie. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm Steve. Although I guess that uh, that would have been funny to name this channel something like uh, Dave on Display and then have me come on and say, in for the vacationing Dave, I'm Steve. Missed opportunity, I guess. Anyway, Steve on Screen helps you become the best version of you when appearing on someone else's screen. Now, I recently wrote a post on LinkedIn that shockingly wasn't about how a meeting was empowering, amazing, incredible, or inspiring. Y you know... Just once, I'd love to have someone post, fell asleep during another shitty meeting, speaker was an energy vampire, chicken at lunch was dry, what a waste of a day, thumbs down. <laughs> but I guess we all can dream. Anyway, I posted a picture of my travel webinar setup that I had lugged with me as I drove around Washington State meeting with customers, because I had virtual meetings to do as well as meeting customers in person. Now, a number of people on LinkedIn reached out to ask about my setup both on the road and at home, so this video will attempt to walk through my home hardware setup, and at some point I'll do another one on what I'm using uh, when I'm not at home, but spoiler, a lot of it's still the same. Now, this is what my setup looks like today. You can see the desk, a large screen, camera, lights, and a microphone. A Nintendo Switch dock is nestled there on the left. On the right side, you'll see my two laptops. And the dock or hub for the Mac that I'm using is hidden here. And this is what my setup looks like when I'm doing a webinar or video on a green screen. Now notice the significantly lower desk and placement of the mic. But that's getting a little ahead of ourselves, so let's talk first about why I did it this way. I built my home office setup with four use cases in mind. First, it needs to function as a workspace most of the time. The second use case is for team webinars or smaller customer calls, most of which that I stand for. If I'm sitting for 30, 45, 60 minutes, I get antsy. I need to walk around a little bit. The third are for those larger, more formal customer calls and video recordings like this in which I'm typically seated. And the fourth, since my office doubles as a guest room, I wanted the setup itself to double as an entertainment option for our guests. Now, let's be honest. The guest uses gravy, this was selfish. I, I wanted a place that I could hide when one kid was watching Suits in the living room with mom and the other watching Grey's Anatomy in the basement, and I still had a place to go to not finish Breath of the Wild on a big screen, because have you seen the text in handheld mode? My old man eyes can't read it at all. Now it became obvious to me that I needed a large-ish, height-adjustable standing desk to meet these requirements. So I went with the Uplift V2 commercial standing desk because it was customizable, very solid, has a powerful motor and a wide range of heights. I love this desk. It wasn't cheap, but this thing is a solid workhorse and raises well over where my five foot 10 inch frame is comfortable standing and lowers well below what we used for a typical seated desk, all the way down to that console height for our guests. Now I chose the 60 inch wide option, but they do offer desktop sizes from 42 up to 80. And while the uplift standing desk starts at about 570 bucks, my configuration ran me about $900. Now what's cool about the flexibility of a standing desk is it meets all my use cases. When I'm seated for one of my big webinars or a video recording, it's low enough. Now, granted, I do need to sit back a little further from the screen, from the camera. So I do have a table that I use, which you probably saw on the photo. Not a big deal, I just keep it behind the door. If I'm using it as an entertainment option, then I can lower it all the way so that people can watch it from the bed or as I'm playing my Switch from a chair. If I'm uh, on a uh, webinar where I wanna stand or if I'm working during the day and I'm standing, I can raise it to that height. It's incredibly, incredibly flexible. 
Now, this desk was also part of my um, weight loss program. It was uh, the height of the pandemic. I just told my physician that his scale is broken because there's no way that I weigh that amount. And then I went home and I weighed myself on my scale and found out that his scale was not, in fact, broken. <laughs> So having a standing desk has forced me to be more active and while not the sole contributor, it was a large part of a lifestyle switch that led me to dropping 80 pounds. Yeah, you think I'm fat now. Now one other item about this desk that I realized later ended up to be crucial. Uh, my camera, my two lights, and the microphone are all clamped onto the desk. So, if you're gonna do that, if you're gonna clamp stuff to the desk, you need to keep in mind the thickness of the desk, and if the desk has sides or a back, cause if they do, you probably ain't using a clamp, like the Resolute desk in the Oval Office, ain't gonna use that with clamps. Now, I love my desk, but the stuff that's on my desk is probably more interesting to you. My display is actually a 42-inch Class C2 Series LG OLED 4K TV. It just rolls rolls right off the tongue. Now, this, four, this has four 4K HDMI inputs, so I can hook up my piece of shit Dell laptop that my day job foisted upon me, uh, my MacBook Air for when I want to actually get work done, and, of course, the aforementioned Switch. Now, my OLED is a little over a year old, so I don't believe the C2 version is available any longer, but the updated C3 series is currently running about 900 bucks on Amazon. Now, fun fact about me. I hate cables. Now, that's not a rant, it's just a statement. I, I do my best to hide as many of them as possible for, yes, aesthetic reasons, of course, but also, I hate cables for functional reasons. When I wanna use my Mac at my desk, I don't have to plug 14 things into it just to start working. I wanna have one cable that I plug in and then everything just works. Now to do this, I needed a hub so that I can plug all my stuff into that hub from the display to the mic to the camera, all that stuff. And then have a cable that goes from the hub into my laptop. So I have all my peripherals, including video, uh, my display, my camera, my microphone, all plugged into a CalDigit TS4 Thunderbolt dock. And then there's a single Thunderbolt cable that runs from, my Mac, runs from the dock to my MacBook. Now, I probably should do a video explaining what the hell Thunderbolt is compared to USB-C, but the quick oversimplified answer is this. A Thunderbolt cable is a USB-C cable, but faster. It's the same size port, you know, it looks the same, but Thunderbolt is faster. It's typically uh, meant pretty much just for data, uh, but power gets sent over it as well. So with this setup that I have, all I have to do is hook up that one cable to my laptop and I have access to all my peripherals. It uses the LG as the display and it even powers the MacBook. Now, since the dock itself has front ports as well as rear ports, I situated the dock under slash slightly behind the display so that I can also plug in additional items as I work throughout my day. I use my iPad a lot on webinars and it becomes a uh, super easy way to just plug in a USB-C cable right into the dock into my iPad. Now, the display's stand isn't quite tall enough to put the dock under the display. So it's slightly behind it. So I did have to MacGyver it a bit with some sticky tech of all things to ensure that the dock doesn't slide back when I try and plug something in. But other than that, the setup's really been perfect. Now Thunderbolt docks can be pricey because it's, a, it's some great tech. It has a lot of bandwidth in it, uh, supports 4K video, all that kind of stuff. Uh, oh, also has a ton of ports typically. Now this one ran me 400 bucks. I wanted to make sure that it supported 4K video and that uh, the dock itself wasn't a bottleneck because I'm flinging videos around as I work on these kind of types of projects. Um, so I went with the higher end option. But if you don't have these same requirements, you may be able to use just a plain vanilla USB-C dock 
which will be the a fraction of the price and get most, if not all, the functional benefits that I have, but with something like a $60 Anchor 555 8-in-1 USB-C hub. Now, I want to get now to the really fun stuff. Lights, camera, and microphone. And when I do that, I want you to keep this in mind. When you're in person with someone, with, say, a client, if you are at all concerned about how people perceive you based on your appearance, the clothes you wear, your haircut, if your fingernails are trimmed, then you should probably also care intently on your appearance in a virtual environment. Blurry video? Well, that's the equivalent of a stain on your shirt. Muffled audio? Broccoli in your teeth? Bad lighting? Maybe that's a twice-worn, smelly shirt? So many people will tell you that the $19 Amazon Basics webcam is great. And it might be, but... I'm going to use a golf analogy here, and it's the one that I have because I actually reached out to a semi-professional to help me craft it. I, I see pros using ping clubs all the time. What I don't see pros use is Wilson. If you want to look like a pro, you need pro gear, or at least prosumer gear. Maybe another way to put it is, um, you know, buy shit, look like shit. Ooh. I think I just had my first t-shirt idea, because merchandising, that's where the real money from the YouTube channel is made. And, and here's where I want to go back to my earlier fashion analogy. Many people I know have no problem dropping literally thousands of dollars on custom-made suits because the suit makes the man, or some other pithy phrase. No, no, but they, they do this because they, possibly legitimately, care deeply about how they come across to others, how others perceive them, what their first impression is. But at the same time, these people will have some crappy Mr. Webcam with a terrible fisheye effect that makes it look like they're peering through a door and it'll have poor lighting control. Or they won't get a mic at all, let alone a good one, and instead call in using their phone. I mean, how JC Penny of them. So, so with that in mind, the camera setup that I'm gonna go through, that I have, I love, but it's a little complicated. But I, I will give you a simpler, really good option. In fact, it's the option that I use, just not day to day, I use it on the road. So I'm using a Canon EOS 90D DSLR camera with an Elgato HD60X capture card to get the signal into the Mac. See, so, so you can't plug this camera directly into a computer and be able to get full quality video from it. So I needed a capture card that translates between the camera and the computer. Now having another piece of software, uh, excuse me, hardware, does increase cost and complexity, but man, I, I argue the picture's worth it. Now this camera, this, this camera shoots stills. Uh, it also shoots video at 4K at 30 frames per second, and frankly, the picture is really, really good, especially for a webinar. I've had countless customers comment on how excellent I look in virtual meetings, and that's due in large part to this camera and my lighting, which I'll get to in a minute. Now, the camera and the lens will run you about $1,600 today. It was another $150 to get an adapter so I could plug it into the wall rather than run on batteries. I didn't think to look at this when I bought it. Um, and I have it mounted on a $100 Rode PSA-1 Studio Boom Arm. Now, to be honest, there, there are probably better ways to mount this camera, but um, I originally needed more camera placement flexibility, and the boom arm allowed me to do that, and it's, you know, I just stuck with this mount. So, so all in, my camera setup ran me just shy of about two grand, but it produces stunning video in a webinar setting, and for these videos, it's also a great handheld camera when I, digital camera when I want to take it out uh, in the real world uh, with the family. Now I mentioned that there's a cheaper alternative that's that's pretty good and, and I'll, I'll tell you about that now but I want to start off with a question that's likely rhetorical. Do you have a recent mobile phone? Like a iPhone or an Android? Like the cameras 
And these things are amazing. I like, like Apple is really focused on making their cameras great. Some, some Android manufacturers have as well. And there's a piece of software called Camo by Reincubate that in addition to some other stuff, allows you to use the camera on your phone as the webcam for your webinars, using that amazing camera for your webinars. Now the cost of the software itself is 100 bucks for a lifetime license, or if you really love subscriptions, 50 bucks a year. They also have a trial so you can try it out before committing, and this software is available for both Mac and Windows Plus. Now I'll get more in depth into this solution when I get around to doing that mobile setup video, uh, because as I mentioned, this is what I use when I'm on the road. Now, while we're still on how you look on camera, let's talk about lighting, because hands down, it's the most overlooked, see what I did there, um, item in your webinar setup. I've seen people with what I think are nice cameras, they sound great, so they've picked up a good mic, but the lighting is terrible. They're either using natural light, which changes based on the time of day or the weather. They might use the overhead lights, which is always flattering, or they're using a table lamp, often with a warm bulb, making them look jaundiced. A company called LumCube sells a bunch of great mobile lighting solutions, but the one that I'm using on my desk and another spoiler alert for the road um, is the LumCube Edge LED desk light. Now, a set of two of these will run you $240, but let me tell you, these lights are worth it. The diffusion, which makes the light less harsh on you, is amazing. You have complete control over both the brightness and the temperature of the lights. So if you want to look jaundiced, you can, but if you don't, you can adjust that as well. They also have USB charging ports uh, on each of them, which, which I use when I'm on the road, but not at home because just the placement of them isn't ideal. Uh, there's stuff in the way. But you're probably asking, Steve, why two? Why not just one? And the answer is primarily because we're not 2D beings, right? Having one light in front of you does two things to you. Number one, it causes a ton of eye strain than if you had two off to the sides. But almost more importantly, from a uh, client perspective, it won't light both of sides of your face evenly. If you turn, you're gonna get shadows, right? Now, now if, if, if you see a professional photographer lighting a scene, they'll likely use way more than two lights, but at a minimum, they will have a brighter light at the two o'clock spot relative to where the subject, or you on the call, um, is located, and that's called the key light and a slightly less bright light at 10 o'clock called the fill light. And that's basically what we're doing here by having these two lights. So we've talked about the desk itself, the display, camera, and now lights. And we have two more categories to visit, and that's audio and green screen. Now, I know I'm old, but I don't really understand the huge ass mic on camera that is the trend on YouTube. Is it some sort of status thing? Look at me, I spent a lot of money on a mic. I mean that the size of these mics are just egregious. Like they were designed as an homage to Dark Helmet. And I get that the closer you are to the mic, the better the sound, but between the Princess Leia cans and the mic down the throat, I get more of a welcome to Taco Bell vibe than anything else. <laughs> Old man yells at clouds and streamer microphone setups, story at 11. Now for years I had a Rode NT1 mic, which is an excellent XLR mic, which is analog. And because it's analog, does not plug directly into the computer. So like the camera, you need an interface between. Now at some point I decided to simplify and I opted to go with the Rode NT USB. Now this is a USB-C mic, so I don't need an audio interface, and it's substantially smaller. Now I'll do a video at some point comparing the sound quality of a couple different mics, but between the size, the really excellent quality, and the less than half the price sticker tag on it, and no need for a separate audio interface, I thought the NT-USB was a good trade-off for the NT-1. Now I do plan to revisit this sooner or later though, 
especially since the fifth generation of the Rode NT1, I had the fourth, was introduced in early 2023, and it includes both XLR and USB-C, so you can plug directly into the computer. You don't need that audio interface. Uh, obviously, it's more expensive uh, than the NT-USB, but I'm really excited to try that out. Now, that said, I'm, I'm happy with the Rode NT-USB, and with a sticker price of 100 bucks for the mic and 100 bucks for the boom arm, I can have this off, or if I want to be hip with the kids on camera pretty easily. Now let's talk briefly about green screens. I am a big fan of green screens because I can completely control how I'm presented to my audience. Now typically, this is what my background would look like. It's not bad, maybe it's a little busy, but there's enough here to come across as professional, but with some personality. But with a green screen, I can duplicate that by taking a photo of my office and use it as my background. But now I don't have to worry about whether or not I left a hoodie on the chair or if the bed is made, or I can swap out and use any number of images as my background. And if you have the right software like Zoom, OBS, or Ecamm Live, you can even use video backgrounds like this live during your webinar. Now, when I say I'm a big fan of green screens, let me come clean. I own three of them, all by the same company that made that camera interface, Elgato. Now, when I bought my first green screen, we were in a different house and my office was in an unfinished basement with an unfinished seven foot ceiling. So it was super easy for me, a little troll, to install a $160 pull down Elgato green screen MT. Now this green screen was amazing, I loved it. The screen was wide enough that it filled the camera frame and it was super easy to use. You pull down and to put away. You pull down again and let go. Now looking today on their website, Elgato still has this item but you can't order it through them and it's unavailable on Amazon. So I'm not sure if it'll come back in stock, but wait, I have another option for you. When we moved into this house, there wasn't a good and easy way to install that green screen MT into the ceiling or on a wall. So I got the floor version of the same six and a half foot screen, the $170 Elgato green screen XL. Now this is admittedly a bit more difficult to set up and store because it's not permanently mounted, but the benefit is flexibility. It's not permanently mounted. <laughs> if I move around my workspace, I won't be locked in because I drilled holes in the ceiling or the wall. And it's the same amazing green, sc green screen, just with a slightly more cumbersome yet portable form factor. Now the third screen that I have is the $160 four and a half foot Elgato green screen that I use when I'm on the road. Now this one fits in my car way better than the XL and it's slightly less bulky to carry to and from the house or the hotel or wherever because I'm lugging it because I'm on the road. Now what I like about Elgato screens in general, because remember I have three of them, is that they're just solid and high quality. The housing themselves are substantial, the fabrics are thick enough to block a significant amount of light, but let's be realistic. Don't put this in front of a window and expect them to block out the sun. Now in a professional setting, you'd likely light the green screen separately from you to ensure that you have a consistent green color. Now I found that the software has gotten so good, at least on the Mac with M series chips, that while that's a best practice, I haven't had specific lights aimed at the screen in probably years. So that's my home setup with a little bit of my mobile setup thrown in. I, I hope this was helpful to better understand some of the tools that I use to make myself look and sound great on screen and that hopefully some of this is stuff that you can take away. Now, if I didn't screw it up, there should be links to the stuff I mentioned in the video description below for your reference. And if this was helpful, let me know in the comments. If this was a waste of your time, why are you still watching? Seriously, there are better things to hate watch, like suits. I mean, I get it. We, he lied about Harvard. Let's move on. Either way though, like it, subscribe, do all those socially 
internet -y things. Oh, and if you want to get all old timey, you can email me at youtube at steveonscreen.com. How quaint. Maybe for a future video, I'll get a fax number too. Until next time, for Steve on Screen, I'm Steve, and you just watched me on your screen. Thank <laughs> you.